So yes, so, so okay, so Chris has already said that I'm neither a convex geometer nor a probabilist. So my my my, my goal, my, my main interest is really hyperbolic geometry. And so my goal with this talk is really sort of to sketch some ideas and sort of about problems that I am interested in and um, so some of it will be very sketchy, but um, I hope intelligible, and if not, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and ask for more details. Um, uh, also, so, uh, I mean, so if time permits, I hope to talk about some, some examples, I mean, which is one piece of joint work with uh, Minkun Liu from the University of Luxembourg, and another one with Thomas Budzenski from Lyon and Nicolas Curian from uh, Paris. Um, but first, so first, my first goal is just to sort of. Um, I, I'm aware that I mean many of you know hyperbolic geometry very well, but I want to pretend that you don't and start with a reminder of uh, hyperbolic geometry. Um, so let me start. Okay, let me start with first with a with a, with a definition which I mean, doesn't give uh, a lot of intuition, but at least formally defines what a hyperbolic manifold is. So. A hyperbolic manifold um, is a complete Romanian manifold Okay, so a uh, Romanian metric, uh, and it's supposed to have constant sectional curvature equal to minus one of constant. So that's the shortest possible definition of a hyperbolic manifold. Sectional curvature oops, equal to minus one. Alternatively, um, more help, already more helpful definition. Uh, equivalently, it's a manifold that comes with the Romanian metric. Uh, and it's lo uh, that is complete and it's locally isometric to hyperbolic space. So I, I'll give concrete examples in, in, in five minutes. Hyperbolic space Hn, so n being the dimension here, which as a set, uh, there's multiple ways to describe it, but for instance, you can take uh, upper half space, so you take x in Rn, in this last coordinate is strictly positive, equipped with a metric that is a Euclidean metric, but then rescaled by the height. Okay. Dx n squared over x n squared. This, this is a, and now it's a computation to show that this metric is constant section of curvature minus one. Um, um, and it's, it's not entirely trivial that this is the same, it's called the killing home theorem. Excuse me. So, yes. so what about the Euclidean sphere and the dimension n? This is, yeah, okay, so this, this, this is a, so the usual metric on it, uh, the, the sort of the induced metric from, from Rn is, is the, the round metric, and it has positive curvature, so it has constant technical curvature equal to plus one. And I can, and there's no way to sort of modify the metric to to ah. to uh, to put a um, that's uh, that's to put a um, to put a to, to make it negative. This this is not this is not possible. No. There's a good remark. So this is um, 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 okay. Let, let me let me okay. Let me let me hand wave the wave my hands at the proof of of the fact that you cannot do that. So. Um, um, the modulo, modulo uh, the same theorem that I'm using here, but uh, so, okay, so su suppose I put a metric on the sphere. Um, yeah, no, it's, yeah it's, not, it's not really a nice proof, but okay, <laughs> let me say it anyway. The, so the, um, the, the fact is, you can, if, if I have a Ramani manifold, I can look at its universal cover. Uh, I can pull back the, um, I can pull back the Ramanian metric, so I get a, I get, I get a, um, I get a Riemannian manifold. The universal cover naturally comes with the structure of a Riemannian manifold, and 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 if um, so, if I have the um, if I have a hyperbolic manifold, I get a manifold. This universal cover has a Riemannian metric of constant sectional curvature minus one, 
Uh, and there's only one such manifold that is both simply connected and has a metric of constant cur curvature, sexual, uh, sexual curvature minus one, namely this one. Uh, so you said that universal cover, cover is simply connected? Yes, yeah. yeah. This, this simply, con simply connectedness is, 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 is important here. And, um, okay, but the problem is the universal cover of the n-sphere is the n-sphere itself, and which is which was not even diffeomorphic to this thing, right? So, the, so it's not this. So the, and spare it, it's not going to work. I'll give concrete examples where it does work. For instance, sorry, sorry, the, formally the universal cover is working. Ah, oh, sorry. The, um, it's um, okay, there's multiple ways to define it. It's um, um, it's a, um, it's any so so um, it's a it's any covering space. So covering space is some, some something that comes. It's another manifold that comes with a map to your preferred manifold that locally is a homeomorphism. So think, for instance, the, the, the standard description of the, of, 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 of the two torus is R2 mod Z2, uh, right? So you, what, I mean, what this is, is you, you, take, you take the plane R2 and then you let the, the Z2 act on it by translations. And if you take the quotient, what, what does that do? Here's a, here's a square of... Uh, <coughs> of side length one, and if you take the quotient, it, 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 it glues this to this and that to that, and you get the torus, right? And the map that you, the projection map is a covering map in the sense that local, if I take a small, if I take any point, I take a small enough neighborhood around it, then this is a homeomorphism onto its image. Uh, of course, if it's too large, you get overlaps, but if it's small, that's a covering map. And a universal cover uh, is, 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 I mean, this is an example of the universal covering map, actually. Universal cover is any is a covering map from a simply connected space to your manifold, so like R two to the torus, and it's called universal because there's a the there's a theorem in topology that says that there's only one such thing. So sort of if I have two covers from a simply connected space to my manifold, actually these these two simply connected spaces need to be the same. So there's no other. If I have a simple, for instance, if I have a simply connected cover to the two torus, it needs to be uh, R two. Uh, and, and, and also the structure of the covering map needs to be the same. Yeah. Does that answer the question a bit? Yeah. Um, all right. Um, okay. Um, okay. So okay. So first, I, before I wanted to give you concrete examples of hyperbolic manifolds, actually, um, the first question is maybe why care? So 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 why 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 would we be interested? Hyperbolic geometry at all. This is uh, uh, so. I mean, so there's more. I mean, I can I, mean, I can think of multiple motiv motivations. The, um, um, so first, I mean, first, I think, sort of uh, first, 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 somewhat obvious reason is that it's sort of if you if you're interested in manifolds of negative curvature, this is basically the simplest case, right? Constant negative curvature. So, so, so these are the simplest examples. Of manifold of uh, negative curvature. They are also, I mean, they also, they are also, they, they sort of naturally, they also, this I'll explain in a second in the two dimensional case. You can explain, you can connect this to Lie groups and groups of uh, groups of matrices, uh, which is also a reasonably natural subject. Then um, in low dimension, they're, I mean, they connect to many different things. So, for instance, in dimension two, dimension two, so hyperbolic surfaces, hyperbolic surfaces correspond one to one to Riemann surfaces uh, and, 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 and algebraic curves. So, studying hyperbolic surfaces is really just the same as studying Riemann surfaces. Um, so, if there's a connection to complex analysis, to algebraic geometry, and in dimension. Uh, so that's already okay. So that's already connected to many things. Um, then in dimension three, they're fundamental. So let me just say topology of manifolds. So okay. So if you're if you're a topologist, then I mean, you you want to understand. For instance, if you're if you work on manifolds, you want to. I mean, the ultimate goal would be to classify. Right, like in dimension two, we have a really nice classification of surfaces. We know that if I have a, for instance, if I have a, it's much more general than that, but if I have a closed orientable surface, 
then up to homeomorphism, we know that it is one of distance, right? It's, it's, it's either a, tor a, a sphere, a torus, a surface of genus 2, a surface of genus 3, 4, etc. But that's it. This is the full list of, of, of manifolds in dimension 2. So in dimension 3, there's no hope of, 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 of doing this, of getting such a, such a nice list. But, uh, but uh, the, the only way we currently have of getting something that approximates this is, is, is using geometry. So, the, um, so let, let, me, let me first do the two-dimensional case. So the original proof of, of the classification of surfaces is really a topology proof. But you can do it with geometry. So, so, so okay, we've discussed this. This admits a positive curvature metric. Tori admits a flat metric, right? If I, for instance, that one, if R2 is a flat metric, Z2 acts by translations. Uh, translations preserve the flat metric, so the flat metric descends to the torus. And all of these admit hyperbolic metrics. So one way you could hope of proving this uh, is you say, first I prove that every two-manifold admits a metric of constant curvature, either uh, positively curved, flat, or, or negatively curved. And then I try to classify manifolds of, 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 of cons with a co constant curvature metric. This works. This, this gives you, I mean, it's much more recent, but gives you an alternative proof of this classification of surfaces. And in dimension three, so the situation in dimension three is much more complicated. It's not true that every three manifold admits a, a constant curvature metric, but uh, the, the, the real theorem, which is, which is the, the, the theorem that people wanted to give Pirol and the Fields Medal for, is that, the, uh, is that you can, if I have a, say, a closed three manifold, I can cut it into pieces by, uh, by removing uh, two dimensional spheres and two dimensional tori, so that every piece admits one of, instead of three types of geometry, eight types of geometry. That, that we can describe, and, and three, but three of these types are spherical geometry, like the three sphere admits a round metric, right? The, the three torus admits a flat metric, um, and then there's hyperbolic geometry, and then there's five others. Um, and in a sense, the hyperbolic, the, the, the class of hyperbolic pieces of hyperbolic manifolds is, is the wildest class, but and it's the only way we have of understanding the topology of three manifolds essentially by using geometry. But first, saying we look at uh, the geometric structure, and then we, we try to figure out what kind of manifold exists. For instance, the proof of the three-dimensional Poincaré conjecture passes through this theorem. So the fact that if I have a three-manifold that is closed and simply connected, so I can contract every loop, then it is the three-sphere. This is a pure topology theorem, and the only way we have of proving it is by using uh, by using geometry. Yes. Um, so is there an issue of um, making assumptions on the differentiability of the manifolds because? Here you need differentiability, but if you ask about classification of top, yeah. topology of manifolds, I expect that you can so good remark. with less. And, and, and the, answer, the answer in dimension three is still no. So the, this is not trivial, but there's a, there's a theorem from the 1950s by Moyes that if uh, that every um, three manifold, just topological three manifold, admits a smooth structure, and it admits just one. There's no different smooth structures. And at some point, this starts, I mean, what we're getting at is this starts diverging at some point, right? Like, for instance, on R4, there are, there are uncountably manifold, many manifolds that are homeomorphic to R4 uh, and have a smooth structure, but they're not diffeomorphic to R4. And so in, in four dimensions, this is already much wilder, but in three dimensions, this is okay. The, so you have to put into the classification this piece of information. The, in the classification, it's just, yeah, and, but in three dimensions, it's just classification up to homeomorphism or up to diffeomorphism is the same. The, yeah, because you have this information. Yeah, because, because, because there is this Moises theorem here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How about the projective space? A projective space, um, so RP3, uh, I, I, okay, I, I said smooth, or, I, said, I said orientable, but that is not uh, necessary. But projective space admits a spherical. It's a, oh, I see. It's a round metric. You can get it as a quotient of, uh, of the three sphere by, by a group of isometries, right? The, 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 um, all right. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the sales pitch. Now the uh, examples. So now I just, I mean, all of the questions I, I'm going to talk about make sense in any dimension, but uh, typically it's already hard enough in dimension two, so now I'm just going to restrict it to dimension two. So examples.
Um, so the first example, so first of all, we can mimic this. So, um, okay, let me draw the hyperbolic plane again. H2, so now, um, so this is, let, me, let me use complex coordinates. This is x plus i, y, y positive, and the metric is d squared, dx squared plus dy squared, plus y squared. Um, and um, I can do this. So what do, what do I mean? I take a group of isometries uh, and I take a quotient. This, this, this works. So first we need, we understand, I mean, the isometries of R2 are translations and rotations, right? So we need a theorem like this, which is that, uh, or in, this, this you can figure out. So um, if I, I'm just going to take the orientation preserving ones, which are, um, um, which as a group is PSL 2R. So two by two matrices of determinant one considered up to a sign. So SL 2R up to plus minus the identity. And it acts as follows. So if I take this matrix A, B, C, D, and I take a point in the upper half plane, then it acts by my restricts function. So A and B. B, C, C, plus D. All right, so that's proving that this is an isometry is now just a computation, right? You have the metric, you have the formula, so you a priori you can compute this. Um, and then proving that it's all isometries it is also not hard, but not, so I'm not going to get into this. But what can I do? So here, what, what Z2 is a group of isometries, it's not just any group, it's, it's discrete. Uh, that's important for the quotient to be Hausdorff. Um, so, so I can take a discrete group. Uh, that's not enough, but uh, start that. PSL 2R. Um, um, discrete. And I can take a quotient. So, okay, what's, the, what's the most obvious example of a discrete group? It's it appeared in Tuesday's talk as well. Uh, I just, I, I mean, Z is discrete in R, so I just put Z in there. Right? This, is, this is a subgroup. In, if I multiply two integer matrices, it's an integer matrix. This is certainly discrete. Uh, so example one. Let me, let me draw. So, okay, maybe many of you have surely seen it. So let, let's, draw a fun, let's do the same thing there, as there. So we, we draw a fundamental domain for the actual on hyperbolic space. So it turns out that um, the fundamental domain looks like this. Now our A fundamental domain looks like this. I take two vertical lines at minus a half and a half, and I take a circle of radius one around the origin. So it's minus one, one. And then this region here turns out to be a fundamental domain for, uh, for, for the group action. Um, so let me just show you at least uh, so, for instance, so let me show, let me try to convince you that it tiles the plane. If I let the group act on that, that it tiles a hyperbolic plane. So, for instance, we have the matrix, we have this matrix in there, right? This is, this is a PSL2Z matrix. Um, and it acts on Z just, if I fill in the formula, I just get Z plus 1. Right? So, if I, if I, so if I, 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 if I take all the horizontal trend, all the translates on this, I already get sort of this whole horizontal strip here. Um, and then um, there's another matrix where the action is a bit less obvious, but there's this one. Actually, these two matrices together is a uh, exercise. These two matrices together, they, um, they generate uh, this group already. So you should be able to tile the whole plane just by, by using a model product of these matrices. And what does this do? So first of all, observe that I put, if I put i in there, there I get i back. So i is a fixed point for this, this matrix. And it sort of it rotates uh, with an angle uh, pi around i, essentially. So, so, not, so this, um, let's see, so this, this fundamental domain here, it goes to something like this here, and then sort of you can fill this, this region up by translating again, rotating again, and so on and so forth. Bit that way, but that's the idea. Um, so what you also see, 
What this also shows you um, is that in the quotient, so the first map, it maps this side to this one, right? So in the quotient, this gets glued to that. And in the angle pi rotation, the second map, it maps this, this you can compute, it maps this little segment to, to this one here. So that gets, so, so what, and, and it turns out that's enough, to, it's not trivial, completely trivial either, but that's enough to entirely describe the quotient. So what does the quotient do? You just sort of take this, this, this strip and you fold it over. Yeah. So it looks something like this. Okay. So here's the, let me color code the, the points. So in, it's that point, and here's, I, here's the image of I. So you also see that, um, so the reason I'm, I'm, I'm drawing this as something that becomes more narrow and narrow is just big, because remember, the, the, the metric is just the Euclidean metric, but then scaled with height. So, so if I move up at, at sort of constant Euclidean speed along these lines, I converge to, uh, they converge to each other in a hyperbolic metric. Okay, so this is a complete, uh, this, is, this also guarantees completeness, um, a finite area. Um, and what you, what you see is the quotient, it almost has the structure of a hyperbolic surface. It's hyperbolic almost everywhere, except that around I, I'm creating sort of a cone, right? Here I have a total angle of pi, uh, and, and so the total angle around this point is pi. Likewise, here I have an angle of, um, I always get confused, I think it's, it's pi over six. No, it's, no, sorry, it's pi over three, and this is, so this is a total angle of two pi over three. Uh, so this is not, and, and where does this come from? This comes from the fact that, um, that this I, the reason, <coughs> The reason that the, I get these singularities comes from the fact that I have this matrix in my group, which acts like a, it has this as a fixed point and acts like a rotation of the order two around it, right? So I get an, a singularity where the where where the order where where the angle is not two pi but two pi divided by the order of the matrix. So conclusion of this story is that I do not understand. You are saying that the, the angles at the two um, vertices are different. Are not, I mean, if I had a smooth hyperbolic metric, they would be 2 pi, right? And they are, uh, I mean, something I should have said earlier is that because this metric locally is just, how do you compute angles in, in, in if you have an inner product, you, you take ratios, right? And you get the cosine of, a, of an angle. So, so the angles, since, since it's- But it's not, conformal, so it should- yeah, Exactly, so this, yeah, that's what I was getting at. So the angles you see are, the Euclidean angles you see are also the hyperbolic angles. And this angle is pi, and then I, uh, sort of there's a total angle pi here, and then I glue that to that. So I get a point in the quotient that has a total angle of pi around it. And here the total angle is pi over 3. Um, uh, and then again, I, I glue two copies of it together, so in the quotient I get a total angle of 2 pi over 3 here around this point. Pi over 3 or pi over 3? No, I have pi over 3 here and pi over 3 there, ah, okay, and then, yeah. uh, then I glue it here. Um, um, and then you see, so the, 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 you see that this comes from the fact that these finite order elements that have fixed points. So if I assume, if I assume discrete and torsion-free, torsion-free just means no finite order elements in the group, uh, then I get a hyperbolic surface. So that's, that's, that's discrete and torsion-free. So gamma is discrete. not only discrete for, I mean, this, this space is not a hyperbolic surface, but it is house door, and that, that's guaranteed by discreteness. Plus stored in free, so no elements of finite order. Then H2 of gamma is uh, a hyperbolic surface. Okay. And, um, So, um, so it, what's the conclusion of this? So this also shows you uh, the, the connection with Riemann surfaces, because I mean the upper half plane is a Riemann surface, right? It's a, it's a, it's a manifold with a complex, one-dimensional complex structure on it, and this group is exactly the group of automorphisms of that complex structure. These Möbius transformations, uh, they are holo bi holomorphic self maps of, of 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 the upper half plane, so. I can also think of this 
as the quotient of, 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 of a Riemann surface by a group of biolomorphisms. So the Riemann surface structure descends as well. So this is also immediately a Riemann surface. And it turns out that this correspondence is one to one. So Riemann, Riemann surfaces and hyperbolic surfaces um, are essentially the same thing. Moreover, you also see that essentially, I mean, two-dimensional hyperbolic geometry, is, but this is what I was trying to get at earlier, it's the it's study of, of, of groups, discrete and torsion-free groups of two-by-two two matrices. This is the... Yes. So, for different gammas, you, you get different hyperbolic. Yes. So what does it mean that gamma is different? <laughs> it means that, the, well, okay, so discreteness, okay, from the point of view of matrices, you just take like here I have this group, okay, generated by these two matrices. I can just vary the parameters, right? I can just put different numbers in here and I get a different group. It's, it's, this, this, it's not so easy to guarantee that the resulting group is uh, discrete and torsion free, so this is not usually how you do it, but a priori this is how you get different, uh, different groups. Um, um, but for instance, well, more and more completely you can take you could start from the polygon here. This is a polygon in the hyperbolic plane. And you could you could you could look at groups generated by transformations that sort of map sides to sides. And if you vary the polygon, then a priori the matrices vary, and you get different hyperbolic structures. And uh, even um, so, let me let me let me just say how actually let me the, the finish this story and then uh, comment slightly, uh, give another reply to what the, the question that was just asked. Um, so this is already discrete. How, how can I make it torsion-free? There's actually there's a finite index subgroup. Uh, there's many of them, but there, there's a very simple finite index subgroup where all the torsion uh, disappears. For instance, you can look at what is usually called gamma two. Uh, of, of, I mean, this is really a subgroup of PSL two Z, um, which is the um, uh, terminology is a pr principal congruent subgroup. What, what do you do? You look at matrices A, B, C, D in PSL 2Z that uh, are the identity mod 2. So A and D are both 1 mod 2, and B and C are both, um, are both 0 mod 2. Okay, why not, right? This, this is a subgroup, because if I have two matrices with this property and I multiply them, then this is preserved. Uh, you can also see this. <coughs> I, have a, I have a map from PSL2Z to PSL2Z mod 2Z, just reducing the coefficients mod 2. Right? I can just reduce the coefficients mod 2, and what I'm asking here is that I, that I land on the identity. So it's a kernel of a map to a finite group, so it's some finite index subgroup. And <coughs> exercise, uh, really just in modular arithmetic, uh, the, this is torsion-free. Uh, so I mean, well, this element disappears, right, because it's not, it's not the identity mod 2, but more generally there's no torsion in this. So this gives you a hyperbolic surface, and the quotient is actually um, as a manifold that's diffeomorphic to a sphere with three points removed. Uh, now, um, let's see how I'm doing for time. Um, so let me skip uh, for now other examples. Stick with this. But again, so also if you have a, for instance, if you say if you have a closed Riemann surface of genus at least two, then by so the theorem I implied earlier, this, this corresponds one to one to our surface. And if the Riemann surface structures are different, uh, then they correspond to different surfaces. Um, so, um, okay, let me just, I hope to get to this towards the end of the talk to, sort of to give you some intuition for why this is true. But for instance, I can look at MG, which is, the, as I said, is just closed hyperbolic surfaces, closed, oh, sorry, 
orientable hyperbolic surfaces of genus G. Consider up to isometry, so I identify any pair of isometric surfaces. So this, this, okay, this is just a set, but you can put a, there's a natural topology on it. Uh, and this is a 6G minus 6 dimensional, I mean, orbifold. Does not, an orbifold is something like that. So it's, it, uh, it's not quite a manifold, but almost. Meaning every, uh, around, almost every point, uh, there is a, there is a structure of R6G minus 6. It's homeomorphic to R6G, except there is a, um, Positive co-dimension locus that uh, corresponds to like the like the, the conical points in the, in the in the picture there, where it has a structure of a cone. So where it looks like where it's homeomorphic to uh, R six G minus six quotiented out by some finite group acting by isometries. This is the okay. So the, I'm saying this just to try to convince you. There's lots out there. Even if I fix the topology, there's lots of choices for the hyperbolic metric. And again, this is the this is this is the spaces. And homeomorphic, isomorphic to the space of Riemann surface structures on, the, on that surface as well. So it's also the space of, of, of Riemann surfaces uh, of that genus. Um, and so, okay. So, so there are lots of hyperbolic surfaces out there, and what sort of what I'm interested in is just sort of uh, um, it's just sort of simple-minded extremal problems on this space. So you, you take a geometric invariant of interest, and you ask how large can this be, how small can this be. The, the thing it compares well to is is extremal graph theory, except you you uh, you replace the graph by hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, so so let me give an ex example of an invariant which has an analogous story in, in graph theory. So which is a systol. So if 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 X is is a hyperbolic surface of genus G, its systol um, is the length. Of the shortest closed UV seek on that surface. I'll draw a picture in a second. Shortest closed UV seek on X. So the picture to have in mind is something like this. If your surface, sorry, the surface looks something like this, then the systole would roughly. Roughly be the length of this curve over here. Right? So it's the, the, the analogous quantity in graph theory is the girth, the length of the shortest cycle in the in the graph. Um, okay. And um, and the question, okay, so it turns out here the question how small can this be? Sort of I'm trying to hint at it with the picture is not is not interesting. And it can be arbitrarily small. If, if even if you fix the genus, you can build surfaces. With a bit of hyperbolic trigonometry, you can build surfaces with uh, that have um, uh, systole arbitrarily small, not zero, but arbitrarily small. Um, but turns out it has a maximum. So abstractly, this sorry, the, 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 this is a theorem from I don't know, 80s or 70s by Mumford that this, this is a uh, this, this this thing has a maximum. And the, the simple question is how large can this be? And let me let me immediately give the sort of the answer. I mean the the, 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 or the, the state of the art is we don't know. So the, the, we, we can solve, the, the, the problem has been solved for surface of genus two. Uh, and, and, and this, this sorry, this, this set is non empty as, as soon as the genus is at least two. So genus two we know and genus three and above, uh, there's, there's some conjectures in low genus what the maximizer should be, but uh, widely open. Um, um, what is max Okay. Um, so let me start. So, so this is okay. So, so 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 the probabilistic part now is going to be like may, maybe there's random constructions that, that can help, right? So the, sort of the idea is the probabilistic method. You you define some model of a random point in, in, this, in this space of surfaces, and you try to prove that with positive probability the system is really large. This is the this will be the, the, the end game. Let me first let me first 
stick to the deterministic set setting and discuss a little bit what one should expect. Um, um, so let me start with the lemma. Let me see what I wrote down the actual form. Yes. Okay. Also, ah, yeah. Let me say. Let me say this. There's other. Why? why I mean, why would you care about the systol? So, so for, it's also okay, just just uh, more advertising. It's also. It turns out this as a function on this set. It's it's a topological Morse function. Morse function. So it's not smooth. It's it's smooth at most points, but sometimes it's 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 not smooth at points where sometimes if if I sort of vary the metric on the surface. Sometimes which curve realizes the systole flips, and at those points it's not smooth. Um, but it is a topological Morse function, uh, which, which in particular means you could... You, there's many things about the topology of this space that we don't know. And you, so in theory, you could... Uh, if you understand the critical points of the function, you could say something about the topology of this space. There's, uh, unfortunately, it's sort of... We, we so, have sorry, to so, in Manfred proved that the maximum exists, or what? Yes, there is a maximum. This is a, it's a proper function. The, uh, okay. the, there is a maximum. The, 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 no, no idea whether it's uniquely realized or whether the, whether it's realized by multiple surfaces, but there is a maximum. Uh, and actually, uh, we by now also know it, that there are tons of critical points for this function. The, so, the, um, so, 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 and then to tons of local maxima also. But, uh, um, okay. But let me first, yeah, let me first say what to expect. So, so let me prove a little lemma. And G, um, uh, sorry, take a hyperbolic surface of genus G. The claim is that the systole of X is at most. Okay, now I need to cheat. So we, I will first write down the formula. Four times, just to tell you, explicit, explicit. The hyperbolic, the arc hyperbolic sine of the root of g minus one, okay. and then more as g tends to infinity, which is the case I'm mostly going to talk about later. This is two times log of g plus two point seven seven two double log plus something times. Mm -hmm. so this is the it's roughly two times log of g. Uh, I'll be, you'll see in a second why I'm making this point with error term. So the um, If you, okay, if you know the problem, if for it's out there, let this comment on the side. Like, so the analogous problem in, in graph theory is, 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 is the following. Is that, so it, it's, I'll, I'll phrase it for regular graphs, so graphs that have the same degree in every vertex. Uh, at least cubic, so a degree at least three. You can ask if I fix the number of vertices, how large can the girth be? How long, how long can the shortest cycle possibly be? And there's a, there's a classical bound known as the Moore bound. So if so, here my graph G is D regular degree D uh, n vertices, and the Moore bound says roughly that. Um, the girth of G is at most two times log the base D minus one um, of N plus, well, you can do it's much more explicit than this, but plus little log of N. So this is the, in the proof. So 
and also in okay. Also in graph theory, uh, sort of the problem that the set of the arc is roughly the same. So the, this is essentially the best uh, asymptotic upper bound that exists. Uh, and the proof is of the two bounds are also the same. So let me prove the hyperbolic version. This version. Um, let me sketch it. Modulo, I mean, modulo hyperbolic tri trigonometry that we need. So let me draw a surface. The idea is you take any point in your surface and you grow, you, you start growing uh, a disk around this point. Yeah, and as, of course, in, in the beginning, your surface is locally hyperbolic. So in the beginning, this looks like a disk in a hyperbolic plane. But at some point, it starts to overlap, right? At some point. So maybe at some point, it looks something like this, and then it overlaps on the back. Um, and at that point, when it overlaps, what happens is that um, I have two radii that meet and create a, a curve uh, of length twice the radius, right? And this curve, this, I mean, okay, this is not a geodesic, but I can homotope it around, make it a geodesic. It's a competitor for the systole, essentially. So in particular, uh, this cannot exist uh, as long as the radius is below half the systole. This, this overlap cannot exist uh, as, as long as the, the radius is below half the systole. So what does that tell you? It tells you that if I, around my favorite point, if I take the disk of radius of systole over two, uh, over two, around my point P, then this disk, this is isometric to just a disk in a hyperbolic plane. Um, uh, but, what, so what do I know? So the area of this thing, this is, this is the area of of a disk of that radius in the hyperbolic plane, which again now, so this, I mean, that's where the, 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 the ugly formula in the beginning comes from, but like this is roughly e to the power of the radius um, times uh, pi. Um, okay, so you see it sort of grows exponentially fast. On the other hand, whatever this, this disk sits in the surface, so it's certainly less than the area of the surface. And this you can compute. There's a, okay, this, you need the gauss bonnet formula, which says, it's a Riemannian geometry result that says that if you integrate the curvature over, uh, uh, over a surface, you get the two pi times the Euler character. Particularly, it gives you the area, because the curvature is constant equal to minus one. It gives you that this area is linear, in genus. So something exponential in systole is less than something linear in genus. So you get a logarithmic okay. bound. This is the okay. This is not the state of the art um, on the upper bound, but almost. So in the nineties, um, Blavatsky proved this. He proved that you can replace the two point seventy seven by two point six uh, something six eight something. And uh, more recently, uh, how did I write it down? More recently, uh, with with uh, Maxime Fortebourg, we proved you can do 2.41. But okay, so. um, but what funny sort of I mean so. But especially Maxime and I, we work pretty hard for this. But the, 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 unfortunately, we don't know that this multi we don't even know that the multiplicative constant here is optimal. Just like in the, just like in the more bound here. So we work really hard to improve this additive constant, but uh, there's there's no no guarantee that even the two there is optimal because the best known constructions also that mimics what happens in graph theory. I do so, not quite understand the, the message. Um, so you have the upper bound. Um, and then you write is equal to, so the improvement is already on the upper bound. The oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. so here the improvement, I should put this. Yeah. You're right. Uh, in the, so forget the arc sign. I mean, of course, yeah. the arc sign is equal. Good point. But the 
so the best known examples, we do know that you can, if you look at this argument, it's somewhat surprising that, that, that you can even, that you could even achieve logarithmic growth, right? Because I'm just, the argument is very simple-minded that you have logarithmic growth and you have pretty large disks embedded everywhere over the surface. And, uh, but you can. So the first known construction is due to, and still the record holder, is due to Boozer and Sarnak. And it mimics uh, what happens in, in graph theory. It shows, it, it uses uh, arithmetic constructions, uh, similar to this, 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 this PSL2Z, uh, uh, these congruent subgroups that we talked about before. Uh, namely, that there exists sequences of hyperbolic surfaces. They, they don't get them in every genus, but there exist sequences where uh, the systole of XK is at least four thirds, so roughly 1.33, um, log of a genus XK plus, uh, actually, minus a constant, a universal constant, um, and uh, the genus tends to infinity, genus with k. Right, so four thirds is the best we can do, uh, and, and, and two is the best upper bound. So, so this is the state of the art, and uh, again, sort of in graph theory, two is the best known upper bound, and four thirds is also the best we can do, uh, with also very similar construction. So the question, the question we worked on with Minkun is uh, okay. We have Twelve minutes left. Is well, how how about random surfaces? Is there are there random constructions that you can use to attack this uh, problem? So the first. So, the. Um, let me please understand because has the problem that if you look for Liu on the archive, you get many, many papers, but if you look for Minkun Liu, then uh, it's really easy to see. So, so first of all, uh, Minkun and I are definitely not the first people to think about random constructions of surfaces. So there are many, there are many well-known well known uh, models of random surfaces. For instance, there is a sort of a Lebesgue measure measure on this, on, this, on this moduli space of finite volume. You can, you can pick a random point using that. There is, it's called the Will Peterson measure. Um, um, then there is, um, then there is there are combinatorial constructions based on triangulations, like gluing finitely many hyperbolic triangles together at random. Uh, and then there's random, uh, random covers. You take, uh, if I fix a surface, and a degree, then the number of covers uh, of degree D is finite, so you can uniformly pick one at random. It turns out that the systems of all of these constructions are just like they are in random regular graphs, they are uniformly bounded. Uh, in the sort of the, 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 the system as a random variable converges to a finite random variable in the, in the limit. So, the, so, so, so not only do you not get logarithmic growth, you don't get any growth at all. So, uh, so you need you need to set up to, to do this. You need to set up the construction to uh, to do this. And this is the, so this is what we looked at with Minkun. So we looked at multiple constructions, all inspired by by constructions from graph theory. So maybe I'll talk about random regular covers. Okay, so we, let me first do a two minute reminder of. of regular covers. So um, let me just build one. Uh, I need some more questions. Draw a picture. So again, this is this is about building random covering maps to a fixed surface of higher of a higher genus surfaces.
So let me first show you an example of a regular cover. Here's the surface. I can cut, oh, this is okay, so I want to build a regular cover of my surface. I can cut this, it's first just to topology. I can cut this, off, this surface open along, um, um, along this red curve here. Then I can take a finite number of cop copies of what I get, so say three. So to limit how much I have to draw. And then I glued, sorry, here the, the red curve is going to create two boundary components on each copy. I glue them together in a, in a circle like this. Okay. Okay. So, so this is, I, I mean, okay, if I glue this nicely, then I have, then I have a covering map, right? I have a map, I have a, I have a map. Uh, from here to here, and what, what is this map? Here I have a group, I have a cyclic group of order three acting, permuting the, uh, permuting the handles. Uh, and the quotient map is, 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 is a map to this surface, and that's a covering map, because locally uh, it's, it's, uh, it's injective, and it's a regular cover. Um, so what is a regular cover? It's, it's essentially this, it's a quotient, you have a you have a, a surface, you have a group acting by homeomorphisms, if it, um, and, um, um, and you look at the quotient map. This is a regular cover. Uh, you have to watch out a little bit that the homeomorphisms, so this, 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 what's special about uh, these homeomorphisms is that they don't have any fixed points right, in the surface. I can also build, you can imagine building a surface like this. Right, with a border three symmetry, but it has two fixed points, one on the front, one on the back. And if I take the quotient here, then this, this again, I'm going to get some sort of singularities around the uh, fixed points. <coughs> so, but I want, um, okay, but this, this, this is a regular covering map. Um, and I, I also have a group theoretic description of this. So now, well, first, let me say, if I put a hyperbolic metric on it, I can pull it back to a hyperbolic metric there, which has a border three symmetry, right? I have, uh, just cut it open along a geodesic, and then I have an order three symmetry acting. There I get a hyperbolic metric upstairs. Um, and there's also an algebraic description of this. So again, so this, now suppose this is the hyperbolic plane, mod some uh, group of matrices. Um, then, I mean, then this becomes a hyperbolic surface, so it's a hyperbolic plane mod some other group of matrices. And, and what is the, um, what is the, um, what is the relation between these two groups? Well, this is the, this is identified with the fundamental group of this surface here, with gamma, so it describes loops. And um, if I have a loop in gamma, an element in the fundamental group, I can look at intersection with this red curve here. Right. So, for instance, this one. So loops come with. Uh, let me orient all the curves. Loops come with. Uh, Loops in the fundamental group come with an orientation. Uh, let me orient this curve too. I can count intersections with orientation, meaning every time it intersects in this direction, I count plus one, and every time it intersects in the other direction, I count minus one. So this gives me a map. So I get a map from my from gamma to z, right? Um, and then I can reduce mod 3, mod 3, and I get a map to a finite cyclic group of order 3. Um, right, and now let me try to figure out what the fundamental group, what this lambda is, what the fundamental group is upstairs. Um, the fundamental group upstairs is exactly, comes from all the loops down. I pick one, I pick one lift of my base point. And to figure out what the fundamental group is, I need to figure out which loops downstairs. So if I take this loop, for instance, um, it, and I try to lift it, I try to find a pre-image here, it's going to look like, some, like this, right? Something like this. Here's, the, here's the, another copy of this base point, and this, this lifts like this, right? And when does it lift to a closed loop? 
exactly when I intersect three times, right? So, so, um, so when in general, when do, does a loop lift to a closed loop upstairs? When, uh, when the intersection is a multiple of three, when I lie in the kernel here. So lambda is the kernel of the map gamma z mod three. So this is generally, you can iterate this game. I just put, I find a map from my group to a finite group. I take the kernel, gives me a random cover with a, with a group acting, so a random normal cover, a regular cover of degree the cardinality of the group. Um, um, okay, so that's the model, namely, the model is uh, you take, as a probability space, you take, you, you, oh, sorry, first you take some sequence of finite groups, so think for instance I replace the 3 by n here, uh, uh, sequence of finite groups. Um, and then I look at all set of all maps from my ga group gamma, which is the fundamental group of my base surface, to Gn. Okay. First observation: this is a finite set. If Gn is finite, this is finite. Why? Now you have to remember one thing. Let me draw genus two surface again. Um, Draw four loops on it. Uh, this. Okay. If you stare at if you, if you stare at this long enough, then you see that if I cut this out, I get a, an agon. Uh, this decomposes my surface into an agon. And then there's a cyber van Kampen theorem that tells you that this gives you a presentation for the fundamental group because an acorn is, is a topological space, is a disk simply connected. Uh, so if I call the red curves A curves and the blue curves B curves, what am I saying that as an abstract group, gamma is in general A1 generated by the A and B curves, AG, BG, with the single relation that the product of all their commutators. Is, uh, is the this, this is just a generalization of saying if I take torus, then uh, so this is R2 mod Z2, right? Uh, Z2 is generated by the translation, uh, the unit upward translation and the unit rightward translation, as the, the loops corresponding to these translations go to uh, the A loop here and the B loop there, say, right? And, and the fundamental group Z2 is generated by A and B, and the only relation is that they commute. And this is just a generalization to higher genes of, 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 of that fact. But so why is this now finite? Well, if I, if I wanted to specify a homomorphism from gamma to G, I just need to give you the images of the generators because every other element is a word in the generators and it's supposed to be a homomorphism so I can get the rest by just concatenating in the same order. So what is this? As a set, this is just the set of choices for these guys that satisfy the relation. That, that's, the, that's the set. And so this is a finite set. Um, counting its elements is not, always, it's not easy but has been done. Is there a question? Um, Okay, so now the question, and so you can pick a point random. So, first of all, cyclic groups don't work if you want systole growth. Uh, why not? Let, let's look at the picture again. Here's a curve, uh, let me not do red. Look at, for instance, this curve here. Then this curve lifts to a curve there, a curve there, and a curve there, right? Of the same length. If, 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 if I lift the hyperbolic metric along. So, in, in if I take higher and higher n, I'm never going to make this curve go away. And it's sort of the, even if I vary the red curve around the surface, there's always curves that don't go away. So, the systole, the systole is, is, is going to be bounded. So, you need something else. So, let's see how much time do I have left? Ah, zero minutes. 
Let me just say very quickly what we do, and then, okay, then not talk, and then uh, let's talk. Um, so what's the, let me give an example of a, of a result, a sequence of groups that does work. So um, take the finite group SL2, so two by two matrices, but not over R or C, but over a finite field. And do this. So let's X, XP be the random regular color. that you get logarithmic growth. Unfortunately, we don't get the four thirds, we just get one third. So the probability of the system XP more than one third plus little over one log of the genus of XP, which tends to zero. It tends to, it's not hard to see, I mean, uh, given the results by other people, but this genus tends to infinity. Um, this probability tends to one is so for these groups, the idea works. Uh, let me okay. Let me not write anything anymore. But just comment. So what's the one-line sketch of proof? So the what's really nice. So what's nice? So another uh, sequence of groups that we would really like to understand is symmetric groups. You just take S n, the symmetric group on n letters, and you let n tend to infinity. This is much harder. Uh, the, so why is this easy? Easier. It's because this group, so this group is a group of matrices. So in particular, this, this thing here, again, what as a set, what is this? This is the set of two G tuples of uh, two by two matrices that satisfy my relation. So it's an algebraic variety uh, over, over a finite field, but it's an algebraic variety. And, and if I'm asking that the system is small, I'm asking that certain short curves from the base surface lift to the, uh, lift to the surface up top. Which sets an algebraic condition on the on the uh, on the cover on the on the on the on the map. So the set this, the set of bad surfaces, a set of surfaces where the system is small, is an algebraic sub, proper algebraic subvariety of this variety, which means uh, that now so the fact that it's all algebraic is really nice because that means immediately that the dimension dropped drops right. If I take a non-trivial polynomial and I take the locus that it cuts out in in R n say. This is of lower dimension than, than, than n. And, and, and things of lower dimension have fewer points over a finite field. Number, like think of, let me say, let me, SL2Z, how, how do I count the number of points in this finite group? I have four, four entries in my matrix and, and one condition, right? So for entry number one, two, and three, I freely pick one of P elements, and entry number four I use to correct this. So you expect. It's roughly true, there's roughly p cubed elements. So p to the power of the dimension of the group elements. Uh, and, and this works for these algebraic varieties as well. So, so you get, just from this really soft algebraic geometry argument, you get bounds on the probabilities of bad sets. And this is, the, this is why this works. And it doesn't work symmetric. And well, the work with Thomas Nicolai is very different. It's about diameters. And anyone who wants to hear about it can talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>